You're listening to Packers Talk Network. PackersTalk.com Do you want to experience the thrill of a Packers game at Lambeau Field? If so, be sure to get your game ticket from the longtime trusted source in Wisconsin, Ticket King. Visit their locations in Milwaukee and Green Bay. Just go to their website, theticketking.com. Again, that's theticketking.com. Throws it up in the air, says a prayer, and Janice says, oh, stop it! Oh, please! (laughs) What a cat! That's insane! You're listening to the best Packer radio show on the internet. Cheesehead Radio. Reach the eye. Can't lose back. So I think that's the logical explanation. Let's just, you know, say that didn't happen. It was a return to greatness. It was a return to form. It's crazy. Um, he just kind of flew into the radar. Get this out there so I sound good on Cheesehead Radio. Uh, yeah. No negativity allowed, sir. So I think that's actually going to be really exciting to watch. I don't think there's anything positive we can say. There's a lot. Oh, of oh you were looking for positive. Yeah. I, guess that's, no, I guess that's what I meant. Positive, I yeah. think. Hello, Packer Nation. Welcome to another episode of Cheesehead Radio. As we were discussing in that intro there, we are going to try to come up with something positive to say tonight. Your hosts tonight are the bewildered C.D. Angeli of PackersTalk.com and Cheesehead TV, the punctilious Michelle Bruton of Cheesehead TV and Bleacher Report. Back with us tonight is the immersed Jamie Snowden of Cheesehead TV, and me, Jersey Al, Cheesehead TV, and Packers Talk. Now, sponsoring the Packers Talk Network this year are the fine folks at Ticket King. They've been selling Packers, Badgers, and other tickets in Wisconsin for just short of 25 years. Please check them out when you are looking for Packers tickets. Their website is theticketking.com. Joining us tonight, a very, very special guest, the voice of the Green Bay Packers official radio broadcast, Wayne Larravee. Can't wait to get to this, so let's get started with some Packers news. Packers news. All right, there have been some big developments in Green Bay this week, so we'll open the show with the biggest one. Not only did the Seattle Seahawks waive running back Christian Michael, which was shocking enough as it is, but then on Wednesday, Ted Thompson and the Packers went ahead and claimed him. And in news that might make you feel a little bit better about all things Packers this week, it turns out the Minnesota Vikings also put in a claim for Michael, but the Packers were higher in the waiver order. I guess losing to the Vikings had a silver lining after all. Um, The Packers placed running back Don Jackson on injured reserve in order to clear room for Michael. Oh, Don Jackson, that's too bad. But back to the topic du jour, which is the alleged growing discord Mm -hmm. between Mike McCarthy and Aaron Rodgers. The quarterback rejected that outright, saying, don't waste your time reading crap like that. I'm going to go quickly (laughs) edit my Twitter. (laughs) I think everyone's going to have to. (laughs) I guess so. Relax. (laughs) In more news that may make you feel hopeful this week, Clay Matthews returned to practice on on a limited basis on Wednesday. Jared Cook was in the same boat. There's no indication yet if they'll play Sunday, but it's a start. And as for the two injuries in the offensive line to TJ Lang and David Bakhtiari that occurred last week against the Titans, Bakhtiari, who hurt his knee, was back in practice Wednesday, but Lang, who injured his ankle, did not practice. Looking forward to the Packers' matchup with Washington this Sunday, cornerback Josh Norman had some high praise for Aaron Rodgers ahead of their meeting. That's number 12. Norman's a white over there. That's a wizard. And needless to say, Rodgers, a huge Lord of the Rings fan, was very pleased with the comparison. And that was your Packers News of the Week. Now it's time for your... Packer Tweet. From Packer Tweets. Well, as the Packers were looking for some hope from Aaron Rodgers this week, perhaps with a shh or relax, there was none to be heard from number 12 himself. But our friend Badger Noonan correctly paraphrases Rodgers to sum up exactly what we are seeing. R-E-L-A-P-S-E, as in (laughs) relapse. Well, as of the predictable, Packers Twitter is full of recommendations on who to fire or cut, which, with a quick study, would add up to be every single person involved on the team. 
But Sports Pickle gives us one many one of the many Packer fans' ideal scenarios played out. Ted Thompson, go Pack, go. Mike McCarthy, yes, go Packers. Don't worry, we'll turn it around. Ted Thompson, no, you're off it. Go pack it up. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, so, were you wondering exactly why the Packer defense couldn't seem to do much against the vaunted <laughs> Titans offense? Well, our own C.D. Angeli, tooting his own horn, chimes in with the use of more suitable defensive packaging names, Dom Caper's new defensive scheme name, Fetal Position. Yeah, that sounds about right. And finally, our Tweet of the Week is actually an assortment of tweets dedicated to our favorite NFL referee and part-time rambling homeless person, Jeff Triplett. Let's just let the tweets roll. Ladies and gentlemen, the comedy stylings of Jeff Triplett, Aaron Nagler. Roger Goodell probably does have trouble telling his daughters why Jeff Triplett is an NFL referee. Doug Fair. Wow, that might be the worst explanation I've ever heard. Jeff Triplett just had an aneurysm while the mic was on, says Jason Martin. Benjamin Wurngel comes with, Jeff Triplett is having almost as bad as a day as Mike McCarthy's play calling. That one was one of my favorites. <clears throat> Tom Oates says, people keep asking how Dom Paper still has a job. I'm wondering how Jeff Triplett has, still has a job. Okay, so I'm wondering both. But Emily Koff makes it short, sweet, and straight to the point. Is Jeff Triplett drunk? And that was this week's Cheesehead Radio Tweet of the Week. Tweet of the Week. Whoa, that was a long one. (laughs) (laughs) CD got carried away with himself there now, didn't he? Come on, (laughs) Jeff Triplett. Using his own tweet. Putting 12 tweets into one, making yeah. poor Jamie read the whole thing. I tell you. Oh, Jamie has a sore throat. Let's yeah. just make her read a yeah. soliloquy. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Anna Karenina, you know what? I don't write as many articles, so i got to make up for it in the tweets. Oh, gosh. <laughs> CD Unleashed. Oh, Django and Chain. All right, let's hit it. The Playbooks. All right. Well, guys, it's uh, four and five. Haven't been here since 2008. 2008. Packer Nation feeling a little restless, or maybe a little worse than restless. Your thoughts as we head into our guest coming up soon on the show, Wayne Larrabee. should be here in a few minutes, but let's just get some initial thoughts. Where are we at right now, guys? Y'all predicted a win this week. Y'all predicted a win. <laughs> we didn't get it. You. you should know not to listen to us, CG. <laughs> I came close. I thought about. I really did think about picking against him. And I said, "No, only Michelle does that." Yeah, and I, you know, I've been spot on with all my loss predictions this year. But I was, you know, this one surprised even me. Hard to fathom, right? Very much so. Yeah, I mean, I didn't watch the game live because I was at my son's wedding. But you know, at one o'clock, we were just hanging out at the place. You know, still an hour or two before it started. So. Naturally, I wasn't checking, but people kept coming up to me with reports, unfortunately. 7 nothing, 14 no- 21 nothing. what's going on? I'm like, just leave me alone. I'm not doing Packers today. You know, my son's getting mad. <laughs> <laughs> but they kept coming up to me and telling me. I'm like, oh, okay. well, I guess. So I, I did force myself to watch it, though, last night. Oh, and then I, that, yeah, then I hit myself with some chains and, you know, did all kinds of other self things. But just to feel bad. It was bad. This was the first time in a long time where I told my husband, if I didn't have to cover this game from beginning to end for Bleacher Report, I would just turn it off and walk away, go take a nice walk, <laughs> go to the grocery store, go clean my house. I would have done anything, anything. <laughs> except watch this game. It was just painful from beginning to end. Yeah. And it just it never felt like there was really a change. I mean, it, the game just got out of hand so quickly that I feel like, and the game took forever, that it must, it was probably around the start of the fourth quarter. Um, my husband was watching NFL Network in the living room, and I come out to, like, grab something from the fridge. He goes, oh, does so Green Bay making their comeback yet? And I was like, no, that's not going to happen. And, like, at that point, they were closer, two-ish scores. But I was just like, no, this isn't a thing. I'm just watching the game because I have to approving comments of people saying Hundley should be our starter from now on and, you know, mm-hmm. waiting for this game to finally be over so we can just move on. This must have been an epic live blog of all epic live blogs. 
be, would that be it, an accurate description? Yes, and I, I mean, I I wasn't there the last two weeks. I imagine that the end of the Atlanta game was probably pretty epic in its own right. Um, I sometimes feel that the ones where it's just blatant that the Packers aren't, they're having their off game, are sometimes easier because it's, by the third quarter, it's just, oh, of course that's happening. I have to laugh at this point. La, la, la. People check you know, out. It's, it's the ones, yeah, it's the ones where it's, they try and then they stop. They try and they stop and it's a little bit closer. And someone's like, the Packers are down by seven and they want Hunley in or McCarthy fired mid-third quarter. Those are the <laughs> ones where you're like, okay, dude, just chill it out for a little bit longer. <laughs> I honestly, not to be, you know, such a, a – Spoil sport, but I thought that Rodgers should have come out of that game a little bit earlier than he did. I mean, everyone loves to see him throw up those Hail Marys and attempt to lead these comebacks, but it was very clear to me, probably a good five to seven minutes left in the fourth quarter that it was just over. And I mean, the absolute yeah. worst thing would have been, God forbid, if he got injured in that game. Yeah, and that's, and that's what a lot of people on the live blog said too, is the the drive before the last one. It was just like, why? You just, this, this isn't happening. Like, it just, just call it a day. And I, I get it because I also don't, I don't want to be the team that looks at a game with seven minutes, six minutes, five minutes left and goes, nope, we're done. But we were done. Right, right. Sometimes, like, I don't want to be that team, but just sometimes you are that team. And well, you we have were to that live team. to fight another day. Yeah. You have to live to fight another day, and especially with the fact that three people got injured and were wearing boots or crutches on the sideline and are just injury luck this season. Yeah, I didn't understand why he, why he played the last drive he did. Right, and also I, I have to wonder if the Packers are, you know, uh, okay, so what are they now, four and five? So, if they, so they were four and four coming into it. So if they're maybe, you know, six and two coming into this game and it was just a weird week and kind of like a, a, fl- a fluke and that game goes how it does. Maybe they don't feel so bad taking Rogers out early. Cause they're like, okay, like we're, we're going to talk this one up as a loss. Like it's, it's fine. But just given the criticism surrounding them this year, the fact that people are already complaining that they don't seem to care that they don't have any heart. Um, I guess I wonder if they were just worried how it would look if they just took him out earlier. I don't know. Um, just curious about one thing, about the, the two of you, what you think. Did you think, like, in the middle of the third quarter that the Packers actually were – did you get a feeling at all that you thought the Packers were really going to come back or you had already set, uh, figured, you know, fate is already done here? I had pretty I did much not. written them off, yeah. yeah. So both of you. Yep, okay. yep, and, that's, and I rarely get to that point, rarely. I am, I am a lot of ball game last person – you know, I am the person who paces and, like, sits in my Pete Carroll stance in the fourth quarter, like, nope, this is it. We do this, get the onside kick, two-point conversion. We're going to block their extra point, run it back. Like, I've got all the scenarios for how we're getting the points. Um, you know, sweating, heart rate going up. Nope, not today or not on Sunday. <laughs> well, one thing we are going to do today is talk to a special guest, so I think it might be that time. Cheesehead Radio. Special guest. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great day in the neighborhood here at Cheesehead Radio. We have a very special guest today. Yes, from the Packers Radio Network and over at Packers.com, the host, the voice of the Packers, Wayne Larravee. How are you doing tonight, sir? Good. Good to be with you, folks. Oh, welcome, fantastic. Welcome. Good having you here. Absolutely. So, Wayne, I'm just going to start us off here real quick. Uh, I know we want to talk to you about a lot of things, Packers, and of course you have a book coming out that we're excited to uh, uh, talk to you a little bit about tonight too, but uh, let's just get right to the, the uh, meat of, of the the battle here. Uh, what's been going on? What's been the post-apocalypse of our loss on Sunday, and maybe the feeling in the locker room, and maybe just around Packer Nation, what are you sensing right now? Well, I mean, obviously there's a, a lot of frustration and disappointment when you're a team like the Packers that has won so much, and now you've lost four of your last five, and the last two games have been kind of, um, you know, taken away early. Uh, you know, they've gotten behind almost before the game began, it seemed like. And 
So there's a lot of I, – I, I sense there's a, a great deal of urgency, obviously, but there's also uh, been some disappointment. And I, I don't know and I don't think you can know what the psyche of the team is uh, at a given point in time unless you're on that team and in that locker room. So the one thing I would be concerned about more than anything else, uh, injuries notwithstanding, um, is you know where is this team spiritually? Where is it emotionally? Because football is played with spirit and emotion, and um, even on this level, it's not just X's and O's. And uh, you know that's what I'm wondering about right now. Where, where is the confidence level of this team? All right, thank you, Hal. Wayne, um, we heard Mike McCarthy do some something highly unusual in a press conference this week, and that is kind of toot his own horn by stating without prompting that he is a highly successful football coach. Now, you've had the opportunity to interview him many times. Would you agree that it's kind of out of character for him? And what do you think brought that on? You know, uh, that's hard to tell. I don't know uh, what brought that on. But I, I heard the quote myself, I, and I, it did kind of, um, you know, that was kind of unusual. That was really, um, you know, but he has in those settings, um, in, in, especially when, you know, times have been difficult, he has come out and been bold. And, um, you know, I remember back in 2010 when they lost to Detroit, they were going to New England without uh, Aaron Rodgers, and and he uh, constructed the battle cry of we're nobody's underdogs uh, going to New England uh, without Rodgers. So, you know, there are times when he does that, and sometimes when coaches do things like that, make that statement, I I don't know, um, maybe he's sending a message to his team as well, and uh, you know, giving them the kind of confidence that, hey, listen, nothing's changed here. We've lost a few games, but uh, the, everything's ahead of us. And, and I think that's probably what he had in mind more than anything else. Makes sense. Michelle? All right. Hi, Wayne. How are you? Good, Michelle. How are you? I'm good. Um, so disclosure for our listeners, I actually um, was Wayne's editor on this book in my daytime capacity at Triumph Books. And so um Wayne will remember that as we were working on this book together, I pointed out that I thought that chapter 13 maybe ended on a little bit of a um, kind of a downer note. And I said, Wayne, you know, I'm I'm not sure. And I had sort of pushed you um, to make a little bit more positive. But in showing why you are the expert and I am not, you were a little bit reluctant because you felt like you weren't comfortable predicting you know, sunshine and rainbows for the Packers this season. And it turns out you were right. Um, so do you think, I mean, is, is the window closing? You know, what is, what is the deal? Well, you know, um, you know, it's really hard. I'm not in the prediction game, um, but, you know, in being in the league for like 38 years, I, I, I may not be an expert in X's and O's, and I don't have to be. That's not my job. But um, you get a feel when you observe these teams and the ups and downs and how they develop and how they rise and how they come down and plateau or whatever. You know, there's a feeling for that. Um, I thought last year they had, you know, coming off that Seattle loss, the emotion of that game in the mm-hmm. NFC Championship game, knowing they were good enough to go to the Super Bowl, knowing they were one of those teams. I thought that was going to be very hard for them to rebound last year. and, and, and that So last year to me was no surprise. The surprise of last year was they got off to a 6-0 and start. Um, but, you know, it, it was going to be much more difficult than that. We all knew that. Uh, I thought they made a nice run through the playoffs. I thought they had um, that emotional baggage from the Seattle championship game had been lifted from their shoulders going into training camp this year. And I really think this is uh, coming out of camp. I felt very strong that this is a, an excellent football team with a chance if it's young players develop to, to make a run at the Super Bowl. But the injuries have scarred this team like, it ha- like they have in many teams this year, scarred this team beyond recognition. And so, you know, now I, I don't know what to make of them because it's different every week. Uh, the injuries dictate different offense, different defenses. It's changed constantly throughout the season. I think for the coaches, this has probably been their most challenging year because, mm-hmm. again, the team and the makeup of the team and how they can compete and how they can move the ball and how they can defend changes almost every week due to the injuries. Absolutely. Okay, Wayne, um, earlier today it was announced that neither Sterling Sharp nor Leroy Butler made cuts for the 2017 Pro Football Hall of Fame. Both were on the initial list but failed again to get very far in the process. Do you think either Butler or Sharp will eventually make that cut? I would hope they would. I think they both deserve it. Uh, Leroy Butler was a dominant player at safety for almost 10 years in this league, and, you know, he won a championship and went to another one. And 
um, you know, was a player. He was a, a member of the all decade team in the nineties. So I certainly think he has uh, the credentials. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Now Sterling, on the other hand, uh, he was a hall of fame caliber receiver, but the, the neck injury, cut short his career, and I think that's what may hold him back. Not his talent, not his accomplishments on the field, but the fact he didn't perform long enough, maybe, uh, to merit Hall of Fame consideration from some voters. But I think both should be in there. Okay, thanks. Al? Okay, Wayne. um, Your new book uh, called If These Walls Could Talk, Stories from the Green Bay Packers Sideline, Locker Room, and Press Box, which you co-wrote with Rob Reichel. Um, I'm about halfway through it. Very, very entertaining. Um, in that, in the book, it was interesting to read that in the 15 or so years that you've been throwing your famous dagger call on Packers games, you've only been wrong once. The fail Mary game in Seattle, and there's a technicality there too, because you don't agree <laughs> that the call was correct, right? But <laughs> what, what I'm curious is, were there any other close calls that come to mind? Oh, gosh. Yeah, there were a lot of them. And, and uh, people would jump on Twitter and, and, and you know, claim uh, that, that, oh, this was a premature dagger, that type of thing. Um, uh-huh. But, you know, yeah, there have been some close calls. Uh, I remember a couple of games against the Bears where, you know, special teams almost foiled it. The Packers had them beaten and Soldier Field, this is probably about four years ago, and all of a sudden, a couple of uh, plays on special teams and somebody on a, um, a, a fake uh, return ends up running down the sidelines. It's like, oh, my God, you got to be kidding me on this. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, there have been some close calls, but um, it hasn't. it's never really uh, been reversed. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're talking about the book. Um, I think you've had a good time writing it. I felt like you did. But – I wanted to kind of ask you, you know, you're known as the voice of the Packers. You've earned a reputation as one of the most respected play-by-play voices in radio. Um, That being the case, how does the experience of writing a book differ from that of doing radio, and what were the challenges and rewards of being confined to this written medium rather than your normal, you know, radio? Yeah, you know, um, you can always – on the air, we, we do every week a three, three and a half hour. Gosh, that game last week was almost four hours. Um, ad lib. And there's no script. There's no editor. There's no rewriting. There's no rethinking. And, and that's a different kind of discipline. But when you write a book, um, and in writing These Walls Could Talk, uh, Green Bay Packers, um, I, I got to tell you, it was so interesting to be able to, to sit down and, okay, so you'd write something and you'd, you'd write it and then you'd, you'd have to go back and edit it and shorten it and uh, that type of thing and condense it into something that made sense instead of just a dribble because I, I kind of write the way I talk. <laughs> and, and that's that's kind of how I put it together. And then you have to go back and read it and say, okay, this doesn't make sense. We have to, you know, put in periods here and, and uh, you know, uh, <laughs> commas and things like that. So uh, it was very interesting. And the other thing is you write it and then you review it and, and then you wait a couple of days and then you write it again. The chapter I did on Mike Sherman, I wrote uh, no less than eight times. And Rob added quotes from people from that era um, coaches and that type of thing. But uh, I wrote the chapter and I wrote it eight times and tried and tried and tried to take, you know, I just didn't, the first time I wrote it, folks, there was so much venom in that chapter that you know, it would have never <laughs> made it past Michelle. I guarantee that. But um, by the time she got it, it was pretty well, you know, um, put together and hopefully had a little bit of fairness to it. It's a very diplomatic chapter, I would say. Yes, it was. I try to be diplomatic, but boy, it didn't start out that way. I can guarantee you. (laughs) All right. Thank you, Wayne. Okay, Wayne. uh, People have very strong opinions about the people who call games for their favorite teams, and especially in radio, I feel like fans develop such a strong kinship with announcers. Who are some of the announcers that you've enjoyed listening to or working with, and what about their skills or styles do do you appreciate? Boy, you know, going way back, um, the guy that actually inspired me to kind of get into this business just by the way um, he sounded and, and the job he did was, this is back in the early 70s. Now, none of you would remember this, but the old, the Knicks used to be a great team, um, you know, back in the early 70s. And I was in high school listening to their games. I thought Marv Albert was uh, the best radio play-by-play guy I'd ever heard. He later did the New York Giants as well, but he was doing everything in that, those days. 
he did the uh, Knicks and the Rangers and the Giants, and I, I thought he was just tremendous on radio. He's excellent on TV, don't get me wrong, obviously, but his work on radio back in those days was just phenomenal, in my opinion. The way he called the game, the energy he brought to it, um, the fact that he could, you know, I, I honestly believe that a good play-by-play guy uh, can tell a listener just as much with voice inflection on a particular play as with words to describe it. And, you know, he was he was the master at that. Other guys I really enjoyed. Jim Durham, the uh, voice of the Chicago Bulls on radio back in the 70s, he was excellent as well. Um, there are a lot of guys that are really good today. Brad Sham does a great job on the Cowboys. Um, you know, one of my favorites, very entertaining. They have a great broadcast, the Dallas Cowboys. Um, and there are a number of uh, others that are just really um, – outstanding they they you know do a great job in painting the picture the thing about local broadcasters and i know this just from being a fan um you know if it's a comfort level in other words when i'm a, i grew up on the east coast i'm a yankees fan so when i hear john sterling's voice on my uh, satellite radio in the car i know exactly where I, I can hear he can say one word and i will know yankee stadium yankees that's it you know and uh, going way back, I mean, back when Phil Rizzuto was doing the games when I was a kid and Mel Allen before that, uh, their voices kind of told you that, that this was the Yankees. And I think the same thing happens in football and basketball. I mean, you know, Marv Albert was the Knicks and Jim Durham was the Bulls. And you go on down the line, and I, I think that's what happens. Uh, Mitch Holtis is a great announcer in Kansas City. He's the Chiefs. These voices become very distinctive. Brad Sham, you just hear one syllable and you know it's the Cowboys. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And I think that's what uh, that's the magic of local uh, radio, especially, but local radio and television, the comfort level that fans build with their announced teams. Yeah, I definitely, I, I agree so much. I grew up watching the Packers with my grandmother and she always listened to Jim and Max. And then when you and Larry took over, we always had the radio on in the kitchen on like the boom box on the counter and the TV on. And that was back in the day before direct TV. So it synced up a little bit better and, that's how I always grew up watching and listening to games. I never listened to the national announcers. So it definitely had that kinship and that closeness that it was very local in your team. Well, and, you know, it was interesting because you mentioned the fact that the technology today doesn't allow you, unless you have a, a device, and there are devices out there, where you can sync up the radio to your television screen, and, and there are ways to do that. But m- most of us don't know how. <laughs> so, um, so it's a little tougher Not a today. Clue. But that, when I was in Chicago in the 80s doing the Bears, and they were in their heyday, um, they would advertise on billboards on the sides of buses. WGN would advertise, you know, um, uh, turn out, turn down the TV sound. Turn on Bears Radio, and and that's kind of that was how it was done. That was a uh, that was a big push back in the ni- 80s and early 90s when I, I was doing the Bears in Chicago. Yeah, great, thanks, Al. Yep, Wayne, um, you were there for the summer of Favre with the tearful retirement, unretirement, and then the standoff between Favre and the Packers. What were your thoughts and emotions that that was all as that, as that was all going down at the time? You know, uh, in our book, um, it, it, that was a tough chapter to write. You know, there were a couple of right. chapters that were a joy to write. 2010 Super Bowl run and all the different uh, machinations that Mike McCarthy used with his young team to, to get them to continue to, to play on despite a rash of injuries that was unprecedented for a Super Bowl team. But, you know, that 2008 season was really difficult to write, uh, that training camp experience. You know, you went back over it and you kind of um, it, it was just painful to write because there was a lot. That was a really bad time. It just, to me, um, it when Brett, I understood why Brett came back, okay? I, I write in the book, I talked about my experiences with Michael Jordan, who only retired and unretired three times. And I well, knew Walter Payton well enough to know that, that he was um, he was not happy with his retirement situation. That You know, he had been kind of promised on the sly that he would own, you know, be, be given ownership of an NFL team or allowed to own an NFL team, purchase one uh, at some point in time. And that never happened. And he knew right away that wasn't going to happen. That's one of the reasons he got out. What he did was uh, to get into that next phase of life. But he was never happy in retirement. He missed the competition. And, you know, the hardest thing, I think we try to write this in the book, we try to to talk about it. The hardest thing is when you're the face of the franchise and you're this superstar, nobody is going to ask you to retire. They really don't. 
and, and nobody asked Brett Favre to retire. They left it up to him. They really did. Now, there's revisionist history going on out there that the Packers pushed uh, Favre into retirement, but that just is not the case. Um, same thing with Michael Jordan and, and Walter. You know, um, when it's left up to you, most guys, most mortal players, even real good Pro Bowl players, come to a point where their bodies are no longer good enough to get the job done, and they either get cut or they get traded and then cut. It, you know, something happens, and they are told they no longer can play. But the superstar is left to make that decision on his own, and that's the last decision that that player is emotionally able to make. And so when Brett Favre was at his press conference just a few short weeks after that interception against the Giants in the NFC Championship game that devastated him, when somebody asked him at that press conference, well, Brett, what are you going to do now? He said, I honestly don't know. And I knew right then and there that he wasn't ready to retire. Because if you're, hey, listen, if you're going to retire from anything, you better have an idea of what you're going to do next. Because you're going to have to do something next, especially a guy who's in his late 30s. Interesting. Yeah, I'm sure that was really, really emotional to write even. <laughs> yes, just, it was. Uh, yeah, you know, because you, re- living- you relived the whole thing, you know, and that's exactly. And it was a tough time. If you're a Packers person, that was a really tough time. You didn't want to see it come down like this, and yet nobody. That, it was a conundrum, is what it was that whole yeah. summer. That chapter we called "Messy Divorce," and that it certainly was. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, Jamie. Okay, Wayne, you dropped the Packers to number 19 in your weekly power rankings, seven spots below this weekend's opponent, Washington. This feels like a team in a tailspin. When was the last time you felt the team in this kind of state? And what's one major thing that the Packers can do or have to do to try to get that W in Washington? There are two instances, actually three. Um, Mike Sherman's last year in Green Bay, they uh, I don't know what it was, 4-12 and 12 record or something like that. The 2008 season, the Packers were you know coming off that NFC Championship game appearance, Aaron's first year as a starter. They kind of got off to a sputtering start, and then you know a, a, a string of losses kind of put them behind the eight ball, and they never really recovered from that. Um, and then, you know, when Aaron got injured, I want to say 2013, when he got injured against the Bears, and then Packers went a month with, uh, like, going 0-3-1, and, and you wondered if they were going to win another game. Um, those are the only times I can remember anything quite like this. But, you know, when you look at the Packers and, and you look at how they're playing, um, you know, I, I hate to rank them that low in the power poll, but when I write that poll, it's, it's not, I'm not writing it from the standpoint of Green Bay Packers. I'm running it from the standpoint of, hey, you put two teams on the field, who's going to win that game? And, and you, you know, who's playing well now? It's not about who's going to be good in, in January. It's about who's good now. And right now, I think Seattle's the best team in the league, and I think New England's right there, and so is Dallas. And those teams kind of have separated themselves. I think Denver's real good with their defense, but I don't know if, uh, you know, Trevor Simeon's going to be able to deliver enough offense for them to repeat. Because I think this year, unlike last year, they'll have to score some points uh, to get back to the Super Bowl, and especially when they play New England this year. Okay, thanks. Michelle? All right, Wayne. So one of my favorite parts of the book, um, you mentioned that a lot of people try to get you to compare Aaron Rodgers um, not only with Brett Favre but also with other quarterbacks in the league today. Um, But you actually compare him to someone else, your boyhood hero. Can you tell us who that is and why you think those quarterbacks are similar? Yeah, I I compare, you know, I don't think uh, Brett and Aaron uh, resemble each other at all in the way they play the game. Um, I think Aaron Rodgers is a modern-day version of of Bart Starr. Now, the old guys would tell you that, well, Bart, it wasn't nearly that good an athlete. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how he runs the team, how he takes care of the football, all those things, the intelligence he brings to the the game. I think Aaron Rodgers, uh, to me, personifies what uh, Bart Starr would be in the modern era with that kind of athleticism. And, you know, to me, that's, that's what makes him special. That's what makes uh, A-Rod special. And, you know, I, I love Brett. <laughs> I love him to this day. I loved calling his games. You never knew it was going to happen. Um, but there were times, obviously, late in ball games when uh, either Brett was going to win it for you or he was going to lose it for you. And there would be no in between there. And, you know, with Aaron Rodgers, the way he takes care of the football and the, the way he plays uh, down the stretch, he's, he's going to give you a good chance to win every time. Absolutely. 
All right, we have been talking to Voice of the Packers, Wayne Larrabee, about his new book, If These Walls Could Talk, Green Bay Packers, story from the Green Bay Packers sideline, locker room, and press box. Um, Wayne's book and has, was co-written with Rob Reichel of Packers Plus, would make a great holiday gift for anyone, any Packers fans in your life. Um, it's available on Amazon, on triumphbooks.com, um, and ebooks are available as well, and the Kindle store, the iBook store, and barnesandnoble.com. Um, if actually you'd like to meet Wayne in person, I believe, Wayne, you'll be doing a signing right on December 1st, um, which is a Thursday, at the Barnes & Noble on South Oneida Street at 6 o'clock p.m., um, so if you can make it then, go, you can meet Wayne, you can get a copy of your book signed, get copies signed for friends and loved ones for holiday gifts. Um, there's nothing any Packers fan probably wants more under their tree. Um, Wayne, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with, with us tonight. It was really great to um, talk with you and learn a little bit more about you and about the book. Great to be with you guys. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Wayne. Have a good night. Thanks for joining us, Wayne. You too. My pleasure. Right. Thank you, guys. Call any time. All right. Good night, Wayne. Very nice. That was awesome. That just it very was. nice. <laughs> he has a great voice. Oh, man. It, it's funny yeah. because I'm thinking that the entire time when, you know, he was, he was talking about um, other announcers that, that have rec- recognizable voices and, you know, some of the names he was mentioning were all – where some of them were here on the East Coast, and voices that I grew up with as a kid, you know, Marv Albert, John Sterling, those voices. Um, and the whole time I'm thinking, well, you're right there, Wayne. You know, you, you've got the, uh-huh. the same feel to me. When I when I hear one or two syllables out of your mouth, I know who it is. So just just a fantastic voice. Yeah, I would like to buy his book, but I want to buy his book on tape, and I want to have him read the book on tape. <laughs> I think that you'd be surprised. Yes. We've had so many requests for that at Triumph. <laughs> really? <laughs> like, yeah. That's that's for him specifically. Idea. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of people actually do negotiate deals to read their own audio books, um, which is great. Hmm. All right. Well, when I write my book, I'll see if I can strike that deal. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> no, let me make a note of that. So. <laughs> exactly. Got it. All right, let's get to this week's Hot Pockets. Hot Pockets! <laughs> anyway, I'll start us out. Uh, Hot Pockets, just a final quick discussion topic. <clears throat> we we saw, obviously, a very tough game this past Sunday. We saw a Tennessee Titans team that is as, is at best a middling team, as best an average team. This is a team that, as we heard in the pregame, was looking to just be relevant. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, what a great mission that is. Let's go be yeah. sort of relevant, guys. Hey, how do you how do you make that a locker room talk? Hey, let's anyway. So this is a, a team that really wanted to come out and make some sort of statement, and they did. They made a big, big statement. One of the biggest statements I think the Titans made was when Parrish Cox uh, took a lick on Aaron Rodgers as he crossed the end zone, and it was it was easily probably a step or two. Uh, too late to really have been considered an accident or not being able to pull up. It was wrong. And it really started this massive brawl, which, you know, it's fun for us to watch. You know, everyone likes to kind of watch it a little bit, a little WWE in a NFL game. But <clears throat> I get concerned that it's a respect thing. It's a respect thing from the Titans that we heard, uh, we heard the, the cornerback from the Redskins talking about Gandalf the white and how much respect they have for the old wise and master Aaron Rodgers, which really sounds like what they used to say about Brett Favre about 10, 15 years ago. <clears throat> and yet they come across the line and they're getting a lick in. And to me, it's a little bit dangerous that maybe a little bit of that Gandalf magic, not just for Aaron Rodgers, but for the Packers, might be gone a little bit. That, that to me, was a little bit of a sign of disrespect, that I'm going to give Aaron Rodgers a lick because I can. And I'm hoping that the Packers can get some swagger back and to command the kind of respect that Aaron Rodgers and the Packers do deserve when they face Washington this weekend. Okay. All right. Cheers, the Al. Hot pockets. You should play your thing after you say your hot pocket. Just, you know, sure. Maybe after each one, we should do hot that. Hot pocket. There you go. You know, I, I think I like that idea. After everybody's hot pocket, you just hit this thing again. All right. I'm still Got waiting it. for our free shipment of hot pockets to come to the <laughs> Tuesday Radio offices. You know. <laughs> By the way, if you're listening, hot pockets. 
Yeah, who makes them? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> needs to contact them. All this free advertising. We don't just do this for anybody. We need to be compensated. All right, so my hot pocket is very simple. As bad as things have looked, this season is far, far, far from over. Everybody is jumping overboard, but Packers are one game behind in their division, okay, against some teams that are really not that good either and not playing that well either. So I don't think it's at all inconceivable that they could turn this around with a couple of wins, but it definitely has to start with these two road games coming up. They have to win these two road games. If they can do that, they are, I would almost say, in the driver's seat going down, looking at the schedule the rest of the season. So let's not panic, everybody. I know it's been awful. I'm not trying to say that, you know, that this team is playing great, but I don't think they're as bad as they played either. And the competition, their initial competition they, they have to go against is in their division is not that good. So let's all just give it another week or two before we all go crazy and see what happens. Thanks. Hot pocket. There you go. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right. Very nice. Michelle. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about Clay Matthews' legacy. Um, our our guy, Jermichael Finley, was uh, spitting some hot takes on Twitter last week, um, basically theorizing that he feels that Clay Matthews got paid and then stopped being hungry and that he's lost his love for the game. And I see a lot of people echo- echoing the sentiment that Matthews can't really be this injured. We've seen him miss multiple games with injuries before. Um, he's not hungry. You know, He doesn't care about being on the field. And, you know, obviously I'm, I'm not – inside Clay Matthews' head. I, I can't say for sure what's going on in his head, but I I do think that not only does he understand the type of impact he has on the field, I think this is a great stat from Ryan Wood. In five games with Clay Matthews, the Packers are allowing 19.2 points per game. Without him, they're allowing 30.3. So obviously he's having a huge impact on the field. They're really missing their leading edge rusher, but also I think I got to interview him last year about what leadership means and how he sees his leadership role on the Packers. And he takes that very seriously. He knows that him being on the field is about more than his production. It's about what he does to rally this team. And so I just wanted to, you know, throw it out into the universe that I think he'll be back when he's healthy. If he's not playing, it's because he's not healthy. Um, And I think that this team's really missing, you know, their defensive leader. Hot pocket. <laughs> nice. That's never going to get old. No, I don't think it no. ever will. I don't think never. so. No, no, not at all. Jamie. Okay. Um, my hot pocket this week is wondering if Kristen Michael will actually play it all this weekend. The last time that you know I'm walking through at work and I get my phone goes off. Oh, the Packers signed a running back. That's wow. They signed someone in the middle of the season help shore up a position that they need help in, Niall Davis, Niall Davis. And I was like, okay, wait, you know, yeah, it'll be tough because he's not going to know plays or protection, but I wonder if they're going to use him at all. They're, they're going to need to because no one else can run the ball. And they didn't use him at all. And then they used him like, what, four plays the following week, and then they got rid of him. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, when I saw Kristen Michael, that news come across my phone, and I was like, that's, a surprising move. That's someone who actually can run the ball. Um, I was a little bit shocked just because I still remember him from college and character issues, but was like, okay, we're, we're trying. We're making making trades or, you know, signing people to try to get something going. But I'm like, but is he actually going to find the field at all? Or is he just going to be like Niall Davis and play like two plays and then go away again? So I, I hope he does play because the five runs that Neo did, while they were helpful, um, we need more than that. And he's on a pitch count, and I'm assuming Ty Montgomery's still on a pitch count, so we need the help. Hot pocket. <laughs> Hot pocket. Yeah. Jersey House found something. <laughs> <laughs> Very I'm nice. I'm on to something, I tell you. I'm on to something. <laughs> Should I play the predictions thing after every prediction? I don't think mm, that's going to be know. Really no. no, no. That's not, not enough. Not yeah, yeah ter- terrible a idea. Bell with hot pockets. Yeah. That helps. See, you, ha- you have bad ideas. See, I have all the good I ideas. I do. Uh, <laughs> keep coming to me, okay? Yeah. 
Speaking of which, let's get to this week's game predictions. Chiefs Head Radio, Packers game predictions. Uh, it's the second game of the Packers road trip as the four and five Green Bay Packers head to Washington. Gonna be, I don't know. It it should be. If you were thinking this was two three weeks ago, easy win. Uh, now everything's up in the air. Let's take it around the horn, Michelle. We're gonna start with you. All right, so this is a terrific stat. Over the last six weeks, the Packers are 2-0 and in prime time and 0-4 and during the day. And they haven't demonstrated to me a lot of other reasons why I should pick them this week. So I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say that that trend continues. And so I'm going to say Green Bay 27, Washington 24. All right. A Packer win. If Michelle's picking them to win. Well, never mind. She picked him to win last week. Yeah. Uh, scratch that. If scratch Michelle that. picks him to win, Scra- <laughs> Scratch Green that up. theory. All right, Jersey Al, what do you say? Uh, I say Green Bay 28, Washington 20, and I have no idea why. <laughs> I'm, gonna be, I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> I'm not going to give you any great analysis or reasons. I'm just picking a Packers win, hoping against hope, and off we go. All right. I'm C.D. Angeli, and I can pretty much tell you right now, Jersey, I'll pick those scores because he saw what I had put for my score and just reversed the team. So uh, not to say that mine has a lot of super in-depth analysis either, but, uh, I, you know, it's not me being negative. Uh, we, we went into last week's predictions with a lot of hope, and we talked about chips on shoulders and how everything was going to be great and hunky-dory and this was going to be the get-better game, and it was the get-worse game. I mean, we got worse. There's a lot of quit that you saw on this team, and I think this team is dangerously close. As 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 positive as you are, Al, and and I do believe you, I do think it can also very quickly tip to that end of 2005 feel where everyone's just getting injured and everyone's nursing something and we're signing guys off the street. Um, just because there's that kind of morbid feel right now, I'll believe the chips and the shoulders are there when I can literally see them. But for now, I'm going to say Washington 28 and Green Bay 20. Jamie. Okay. Um, my husband is a Washington fan, which some people may know from season's past. And for years, I have spent so much time just feeling bad for him because I have always had the better team. Last week, after, well, actually in the middle of the Packers game, I just went out to my husband and said, you're going to win next week. You've been really nice to me this week, so you deserve it. So I'm just, I've given up. Like, my husband's team has sucked for so long, and he's been so nice to me that I was like, oh, you deserve a win. So I originally had the Packers losing. Um, But I think some of us know a very good Packers fan and friend could use a win right now. And I personally feel like the football gods should align with Adam. So I'm going to go with that and say that for that reason alone, I am picking Green Bay 24, Washington 21. Excellent. Yeah, and a very good reason for a Packer win. Hopefully that will happen. Yes. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight on Chiefs Head Radio. And a very special thanks to our special guest, Wayne Larrabee. Make sure to head on over to PackersTalk.com where you can explore several unique Packers podcasts. Please follow at PackersTalkNet on Twitter and like the Packers Talk to Head Radio and all the Packers Talk podcasts are available on iTunes. Just Google Packers Talk iTunes and you'll find it. Be sure to subscribe and please leave us a good review if you can. You can also listen in by using Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or your favorite podcast app and search for Packers Talk. Finally, please, please, please be sure to support our sponsor, Ticket King. You can find them on the web at theticketking.com. That's theticketking.com. That's a wrap. Go Pack Go! To make poor Jamie read way more than she should be tonight. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to go <laughs> hug, hug my humidifier so I can cheer on the Packers on Sunday. It's, it's like every other week I try to shorten that outro a little bit. Like I took a few <laughs> words out. I took a few words out last week. and I'll still work on it some more. Anyway. All right. <laughs> that's it, folks. That's it. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Go, go Pack Go. go. We'll talk right. to you next week.
When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can be confusing. Like Swedish techno confusing. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Dance with me, purple cow. Bark, bark, meow, meow. Ooh, you lovely cow. Geico makes it easy. With 24-7 access, all you have to do is go to Geico.com and you could save money on car insurance. It just makes sense. Unlike, you know. Dance with me, purple cow. I like your moves. Danny, I just figured out that if I switch to Metro PCS, I get two Samsung Galaxy phones free. Cool, Dad. And I could be a super dad with two free Samsung Galaxy phones and call myself Double Galaxy Man. Or you could give the second phone to your sidekick. Yeah, I guess I could do that. That's right. Two free Samsung Galaxy On5 smartphones are all yours when you switch to Metro PCS. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figured out. Coverage not available in some areas. Sales tax not included in phone price. Excludes numbers on the team.